start out that one. Hello, everybody. Mike Westfall here at McDonald Garden Center, um, and I'm going to be doing our seminar on herbs, Growing Herbs 101. So um, just to kind of let everybody kind of kind of get into the video and kind of join, um, just going to say hello and just say a couple things. I uh, hope everybody's staying safe. Um, we continue to bring you these uh, webinar live Facebook events so that we can continue to educate our customers. Um, it's very important to us um, that we can continue to do this for you. Um, and hopefully everybody can stay safe and, um, you know, reach out to us if you have any questions about anything. Uh, we're a very safe garden center to shop. Uh, we're big stores, so our Great Neck location, um, hey Ryan, um, and our, um, our independent store are big. Our markets are located all over Hampton Roads. They're great convenience locations to pop into. They carry a lot of these herbs that I'll be talking about today. Um, so, and, and just some great people out there and, um, it's just a great thing that we can do to kind of support, uh, a, a local business and, uh, keep us, keep us afloat and keep us through this, uh, pandemic. And, uh, so we appreciate your business and we appreciate you all staying safe and we're staying safe and, uh, we'll get through this together. But, um, McDonald Garden Center has been in Hampton Roads for 75 years. Uh, we know this area very well and that's why we want to educate and continue to educate everybody. Um, was just there for Brandon. Hey, was just there for our, your hot peppers. Good. Um, so as you know, it's a great experience here. We have lots to offer right now. We have so many different plants right now. Um, so it's just a great time to be in the store, uh, be in your yard, uh, kind of de-stress a little bit. If you're stuck at home, it's a great thing to do, kind of get some exercise and be out in your yard um, and work um, on your vegetables or your edibles or your herbs or your just ornamental plants. Um, hey, Denise. So, um, so, all right, I think we'll get started. Uh, we got about 20 people in here, so uh, we'll let everybody else kind of funnel in through the time. So I uh, want to talk to you about herbs. That's what we're going to talk about today is specifically herbs. And I'm going to spend just a little bit of time uh, talking about just how to grow them. Uh, not a ton of time because they're very easy. I mean, that they're so rewarding and they're easy plants to grow. Um, so I definitely recommend them and they can be grown in so many different ways. Um, and then I want to show you all the different types of herbs. There's so many to choose from. I'll go through some of our favorites. Um, I'll go through, through some of the ones that uh, a lot of people do um, and uh, in this area, and, that some, and then I'll let you know if they're annual or perennial and what you can use for cooking them or how to use them in, in different types of dishes and stuff like that, uh, what most people use them for. Um, so let's get started on just kind of uh, their, how, the versatility of herbs. Uh, you can grow them in containers. I got this one right here. Look at this. You got this little bushel basket here with all this sage and rosemary and thyme and some mint. So, I mean, you can grow a combination of herbs just like this, super, super easy. Um, you can grow them in containers, a lot of people do. Um, in fact, sometimes I might even recommend it, like this lavender next to me, um, you know, grows great in containers. Um, but you can grow them in raised beds, you can grow them in the ground, you can grow them in your landscape. Lavender or rosemary in the landscape is an awesome ornamental plant. Um, so, you know, you can grow these anywhere if you don't have a lot of space um, or if you have a lot of space, but it's all taken up by, you know, landscaped beds, you can use these in your landscape. A lot of people call it foodscaping, um, but herbs are gorgeous plants um, and very easy to do. So you can grow them in pots, raised beds, in the garden, you know, in a formal kind of, you know, garden setting with all your vegetables and stuff, um, or in the landscape or even inside your house. So you can actually grow herbs inside your house. Now, herbs love full sun. So that's going to be the next topic is they need light. So as I go back to growing them in your house, you typically are going to want to find a window that's very, very sunny that gets the most sun that you can possibly get it. Typically, that's going to be south facing um, or uh, uh, um, east, east and north are going to be your morning sun um, or north might not get any sun, but your west and south facing are going to be the best. Um, south is, should get it most of the day, almost all day. Um, unless you've got trees or anything like that. But you can also buy grow lights. I mean, grow lights are very easy. We've got like the clamp on light that you can just clamp onto a shelf or something and you got a grow light. We've even got the strip lights that you can mount underneath like a cabinet in the kitchen and grow your herbs there. So you can do a lot of different things with herbs inside. Um, you can grow them on your windowsill. You can grow them right outside on your windowsill in a, uh, in a basket. So you can just open up your window and fresh clip your herbs. So lots and lots of versatility. Um, so let's go to the light. Of course, herbs love full sun. But the nice thing about herbs is they're a little bit more versatile than, say, peppers, 
or uh, other vegetables that really, really require a lot of sunlight, herbs can take a little bit of shade. Um, it's not a horrible thing on them. Now, certain ones, maybe like sage, lavender, um, you might end up with some powdery mildew issues if you've got a lot of shade. Um, and what you're going to experience in shade is going to be a little bit of stretching. Plants are going to stretch. And when, when plants get thin and leggy um, or they stretch for the light, that means they're reaching out for the light because they want more. So they're trying to find it. And that's what happens in a shady condition. It's not going to be a bad thing. Your plants just might be a little leggy. So if that's all you got and you want to grow herbs, you definitely can still do it. They don't require all, all day sun, although that's fine too. So get them as much sun as you possibly can. But if you got a little bit of shade, that's okay too. Um, so then let's talk about soil real quick. Soil, again, I always talk about soil. It's very important to invest in soil when you're growing plants. That's where they live. That's where the root system lives. That's where it's going to get its nutrients. So very important to, um, to, to invest a little bit in your soil. First and foremost, growing in pots, you got to use potting soil. We have a natural and organic potting soil and we've got an all-purpose potting soil. The main difference between the two is natural and organic is great for outdoors. All-purpose works great indoors. Um, I might suggest all-purpose for plants like lavender or rosemary that you're growing in a pot because they like it a little bit more loose and a little bit more, not, not, not that it's sandy, but um, it doesn't hold as much moisture and our natural and organic does. So if you're growing in pots, use a potting soil. Don't use a garden soil. Garden soils are designed for in the ground, but a potting soil is designed for a pot, and that's what you, that's what you want to use in a pot. Um, if you're doing raised beds, then the reason for doing raised beds is you can control that media that you're growing in. And so here we, we can recommend lots of different things. We have lots of different types of compost, um, topsoil, vermiculite, perlite, peat moss. We've got all these things that you can amend, and you can play with and make different types of mixtures for your raised beds. So you can grow herbs in raised beds, but know how to amend your soil and what you want to do. Um, and then we want to talk about um, uh, in the ground. So in the ground, if you're growing in your landscape or if you're growing them in your vegetable garden that's just straight directly in the ground, you want to amend your soil. Our soil here tends to be on the clay side. Uh, clay, you want to amend with compost and perlite. That helps add some nutrients, adds a little bit of fluffiness. Um, and then the perlite helps kind of the drainage and lets the root system take. So when you want to amend your soil, now if you've got sandy soil, you might want to add peat moss. Peat moss is going to hold moisture in help thicken it up. So peat moss and compost to amend to sandy soil. Uh, we did a soil seminar. So if you really want to learn about soil, that was an hour long seminar on just soil. Um, so you can check that out if you want to on our Facebook page or on our website. Um, and then pH. So the nice thing about pH, pH, important part of pH is in the right range, in the right pH range, um, the plants can get the nutrients out of the soil naturally and out of the fertilizer. So if you're way out of whack on your pH, then um, the plant won't be able to get all the nutrients that it needs. And if you're applying a fertilizer, it might only be getting 50% of that fertilizer. So you could be wasting money. You do a simple pH test. Uh, you can bring in a soil sample to us and we do a pH test right on the spot for you if we're available to do so. Um, and if not, we can give you a call back pretty quickly. Um, but that kind of helps. Most potting soils are going to be in the right range, somewhere between a six and a seven, which is kind of ideal for herbs. The nice thing about herbs is they're pretty versatile. A lot of them drop down to a 5.5 to a 7.5. So you got a pretty wide range and consistently in this area, we're at about a 5.5. Um, if you wanna raise your pH a little bit, which I don't think would be a bad thing for a vegetable garden, a raised bed, add a little bit of lime. That'll help bring up your pH. Magical does a little bit faster. Um, so I won't talk too, too specifically because I think a lot of people grow herbs in pots um, or in a raised bed. Um, and if you see a plant struggling, you might check the pH. Uh, instead of just adding fertilizer and fertilizer and fertilizer, check the pH, that could be the issue. Um, so let's talk about fertilizer. Fertilizer would be the next thing that we'd wanna talk about. You can use lots of different types of fertilizers for your herbs. Um, and I always recommend our green leaf, of course. This is our green leaf fertilizer. So this is our traditional green leaf. And then we've got our organic green leaf. Let me get that label turned around for you. See if we can get it out of the sun there. So we've got our two green leaves. We've got our traditional over here, and then we've got our organic. Um, both of them are designed for this area, so they've got some micronutrients in it that are really beneficial. They're higher in nitrogen, which is what you typically want for herbs. Nitrogen promotes green growth, and that's what you typically want out of your herbs is more greenery so that you can cut them and use them. Some you might be using for flowering. They're going to flower regardless. <laughs> um, but the green leaf is a great uh a traditional or organic formula uh, designed for this area and has lots of trace elements, those micronutrients that most bigger companies don't put in their fertilizers. Boron, copper, zinc, molybdenum, all that fun stuff. Uh, but those little small things are important. It's not just all the macronutrients, it's also the micronutrients that are important. 
The Spoma's Garden Tone, of course, we love this. Um, Garden Tone is just a very easy formula that you can use on all vegetables, all your herbs. So if you're doing a big vegetable garden with herbs all over the place, you can get this in a four pound, eight pound, 18 pound. So this comes in a nice big size if you need to. Uh, but a Spoma Garden Tone, all organic, very natural, very safe, very easy to use. Um, and then if you're, some people love to use liquid fertilizers. Sometimes I'll take a watering can um, and fill it up with water and let it sit for about two or three days um, because that'll kind of help get some of the, uh, the fluoride and the bleach out of our, our drinking water. Helps kind of evaporate that. And then I'll put this in there and then I've got a nice mixture that I can use to water my herbs throughout the entire week. Um, but this is a 2020-20 all-purpose fertilome, uh, all-purpose wa water-soluble plant food. So very easy to use. You just read the directions, you mix it with a couple gallons of water, and then you've got your fertilizer for that week. And then you take a couple weeks off and you come back again with it. Um, so timing, water soluble, you're gonna use a little bit more. Again, depends on the application. In the ground, maybe every three to four weeks with herbs. Um, in a pot, maybe every one to two weeks with herbs. Uh, just depends on how good the drainage is because the nutrients are going through the soil. With a granular fertilizer like the green leaf or the Spoma Garden Tone, um, probably about in, in the ground every six weeks, maybe even eight, eight weeks. You don't need to fertilize herbs as much as vegetables because they're just producing green growth. They're typically not producing a fruit, which is going to use more energy like a tomato plant. Um, but uh, in a pot or in a raised bed, you might be doing every four to six weeks. So six to eight weeks in the ground in a pot, four to six weeks. But you don't need to be as heavy with it um, on uh, herbs. Uh, if you just have a basic plant tone hanging around the house or any kind of other all-purpose fertilizer, that works great. Um, again, it doesn't have to be super, super specific with herbs, but very easy. So there's your kind of fertilizer part. Okay, I'm gonna talk real quick on drying um, herbs. Uh, so drying herbs, a lot of people um, want to know how to do that. It's a pretty simple process, uh, but the best thing to do is I typically recommend doing it towards the end of the year. Um, so I'm using fresh herbs all spring, summer, into the fall. Um, and those fresh herbs are great to use. You've got the best flavor, the oils are in there. So that's really the best way to use uh, herbs is when they're fresh, but then you can dry them. So towards the end of the season, if we see some cooler temperatures coming and you wanna go ahead and do a good cutting on them uh, so that they can regrow a little bit, maybe going into winter like rosemary um, or lavender or some of the other ones that, that I'll talk about as we go on, thyme, things like that that aren't gonna grow much but are gonna make it through the winter, but you wanna let them regrow a little bit. Uh, you can prune those off, and the best thing to do is just clip them, get about three to five branches in a bundle, put them together, wrap a little bit of twine around it. I use zip ties. It's a great little technique. Use zip ties because as they dry, they'll shrink a little bit, and then you can keep twisting that twist tie to keep it tight. You can use rubber bands. You can use a lot of different things. Um, so you just basically want to tie them together. You can hang them to air dry, and that's perfectly fine. A lot of people will use um, a paper bag, and you just punch some holes in it. Punch some holes in a paper bag. That kind of helps keep uh, some of the, the dampness if you have a, uh, a, a humid room, which you don't want to dry them in a kitchen. You know, you typically see them hanging in a kitchen, but kitchens, you're washing dishes, you got a lot of humidity in a kitchen, and you want a warm, dry place. That's the best thing you can use. It's a warm, dry place. So maybe like a sunroom um, or a living room that maybe you don't use as much, um, but there's great areas that around your home typically that are going to stay warm and that are going to be nice and dry. Um, so that's kind of what you want to do for drying your herbs naturally. Now you can do it in an oven or a microwave. You can go online. There's lots of different techniques out there. Um, but if you use them in an oven or a microwave, the difficulty is typically you're going to cook some of those oils and you're going to lose a little bit of the flavor. So if you can air dry them, it's so much better. Um, and we'll talk about how, you, you know, a couple different things about drying techniques as I go through. Some of the easy ones to do are bay, bay leaves, easy, dill, marjoram. Um, oregano, rosemary, uh, thyme. So those are all pretty easy ones. There's not a lot of moisture in the leaves. And because there's not a lot of moisture, they're much easier to dry. Now the ones that are a little bit harder are basil, chives, mint, tarragon. Um, those you might try freezing. Freezing is actually a very good technique. You can put them right in the freezer and they last for about six months. Um, if you dry your herbs, they'll typically last about a year. Keep them in an airtight container. Keep them out of the sun, so don't line up your glass jars. Um, or I like to just take the twigs and just put them into a ball jar. But keep them in a shady spot, you know, out, out of the window sill, um, so they don't uh, they don't get uh, you know dried out even faster or get dried up worse. Um, you keep them in a shady place in a sealed up jar. They'll last for about a year. Um, if you experience any kind of mold or anything, pick those leaves off. Hopefully it doesn't continue to grow. If it does, then you just need to discard and try again. 
Um, if you see mold forming once you've can't once you've put them in a jar, then you definitely are going to want to discard of it uh, because that's going to spread and it's going to spread fairly quickly. Um, but you basically just think about it. Cut off a branch. I mean, you've probably seen it in magazines or on Pinterest. Um, cut off a couple branches. Um, take off some of the bottom leaves so you got a stem. Tie it up. Hang it upside down. Good to go, and it's easy to dry. And just try it. It's just fun to try. Um, and then that way you can kind of keep going. Um, so those are kind of my best recommendations on drying herbs. All right, so pruning. Pruning, uh, we'll go to that real quick, and then we'll start talking about all these different herbs that I've got lined up over here I'm excited to tell you about. Uh, pruning, my favorite comment is use them or lose them. Um, herbs are basically grown to be cut on and to be used, so definitely use them. Cut them, use them. If you don't have, if you've got too much and you need to use them, cut them and air dry them, or cut them and give them to a neighbor. Uh, so you know you got a lot of different ways of using them. Look up recipes on the the internet. Look up different types of recipes. Call your family and friends. Ask if they know how to make you know butter out of you know sage. You know sage butter is real popular. Um, so, you know, if you've got a lot of extra herbs and you need to use them, then use them um, or freeze them or air dry them, all those different techniques. Use them in dishes, start to look up different types of recipes to use them. Uh, there's lots of applications. And again, giving them to friends or worst case is if they're starting to get big and they're starting to get crazy and you just don't have a use for them, at least just prune them and discard of it because it needs that. It needs that to continue to grow. And what typically will happen with herbs and what you don't want on a lot of them cilantro, basil, is you don't want them to flower or call bolting. And if they bolt, they stop producing leaves. They go into flower producing mode to seed, uh, which some of them like cilantro, you will want to seed because uh, you can turn it into coriander uh, for spices. Um, but typically what you're going to want is your leafy greens. And so if you keep cutting, they keep producing leaves and they're kind of not thinking about flowering yet. Now at certain temperatures, they're going to flower. That's inevitable. Um, and there's nothing you can do about that. I'll talk about a little bit when we get into the varieties about different varieties that will flower less or hold off on flowering a little bit more. But I always say use them or lose them. Herbs love to be clipped. It promotes a fuller plant. Um, it keeps it nice and dense and compact. Doesn't let it get too big and crazy. Um, and hopefully it'll prevent them from flowering. So I hope those techniques help that we talked about soil. So we talked about the right types of soil, pots, potting soil, raised beds. You can amend your own soil and amending your soil if you're doing them in the ground. We talked about light, give them as much sun as you possibly can, but a little bit of shade is not the worst thing either. We talked about feeding them, fertilizing them. You don't have to fertilize them as much, but you definitely want to continue to feed them. Um, it's not a bad idea after you cut them to wait a couple days, then give them a little fertilizer if you haven't done so in about four to six weeks um, in a pot and then in the ground about every six to eight weeks. Uh, we talked about pruning them, use them or lose them. Uh, trust me, you got to use them, you got to prune them. Um, and then we talked about a little bit about drying. Um, so I hope those kind of help you. Uh, they're so versatile. Like I said, you can grow them in strawberry jars. You can grow them in clay pots, plastic pots, terracotta pots, um, ceramic pots like this one next to me. You can grow them in so many different ways, um, in the landscape, in a raised bed, in a flower bed. Um, so, so easy to use. And I definitely recommend them. But now what I want to do is really go through all the different types of plants that we have here. And that way I can just kind of go alphabetically and hopefully I'll stay alphabetical as best as I can. And I'll show you all the different types of plants and I'll talk a little bit about, you know, how you can use them. Um, so of course the B start with the B and it's basil. So basil of course is probably one of the most popular herbs out there. This is sweet basil and you're going to see a lot of chef Jeff from us. So this is chef Jeff's sweet basil. Um, and the nice thing about Chef Jeff is they'll give you a little kind of synopsis on the back, a little story. So this one will give you your full sun, the height, the spread, um, what you can use it in. It just kind of gives you a little bit of information about it. So it's a great kind of information if you can't grab one of us, if we're busy, um, and you can't quite, you know, get, get a, um, a customer service representative to help you, um, then a lot of the information is right here on this tag. I love their tags. Great company. And again, you can see GMO free. So really, really good company. Um, sweet basil. Awesome. People love it. You can use it in a lot of different things. Think about the tomato uh, based dishes a lot in Italian pesto sauces right into a salad. Um, you got lots and lots of uses of basil. People love basil. This is sweet basil. It gets kind of big. So you definitely want to keep pruning this and pinching this, helping to promote a fuller plant. So you can always just kind of go and when you go to use them, just kind of pinch them off or you can use little pruners. So like I love my little tiny pruners here. These have a nice little pointed point so you can get in there very easily and you just slide them open and it's a bypass so it's like a scissor. You can use scissors because most of these aren't going to have real thick stems. 
but these are great little tool to have around just to go in there and snip. Um, so basil, very, very easy one to grow. Definitely recommend it. A lot of people use it. There's a lot of different types of basil too. And I'm not going to go through every type of everything. I'll try to go through as much as I can, but this is Thai basil. So Thai basil, this is a uh, Siam queen. There's a couple different types of Thai basil, but Thai basil is going to be a little bit on the spicier side. You're going to use them in stir fries most likely. It's got a little bit of that peppery taste to it. So that basil with a little bit of pepper, Thai basil. So we've got the Thai Siam queen. Um, and then this is kind of a cool one. Uh, this is called Greek polymer basil. This can actually get four, six feet tall, um, grows straight up in a very nice column. So if you're doing like an herb container, like I was showing you earlier, this could be a centerpiece right here because it's going to be that straight up grower. Really kind of cool. If you want it to be a little bit fuller, you just, again, pinch because it's going to promote branching and it's going to fill out a little bit more. But um, just same sweet kind of basil type of, of taste. And this is called basil Greek columnar. So kind of a cool basil you might not have seen before. There's a couple other ones. There's the purple basil. We just got some purple basil in. Um, there is um, the Dolce Fresco, which I really love. I don't think we have that right now, but we're going to continue to try and get more in. Dolce Fresco is just like sweet basil, but it kind of forms like a nice little globe. There's boxwood basil uh, that was real popular. That one's kind of hard to get uh, our hands on right now too. Uh, but we have a good selection right now. We've got the columnar, we've got the Thai, and we've got the regular basil, the sweet basil, and we've got some purple basil. So you can come in and check out all the different types of basil. Basil's awesome, awesome uh, herb. Um, so then we'll go to bay. So bay would be next. And I apologize, I got them all over the place, all around me. But bay leaves are awesome. I used to remember my mom had one of these right outside her back door. You used to always pick the leaves and throw them right into stews and soups and different things. Now, you don't eat these. They're just used as a spice or as a way to flavor your uh, dishes. Uh, but you throw the leaves in there. Great in a pot roast. You know, just so many different uses for bay. Uh, marinades. A lot of people use them for marinades, poultry, fish. Lots of different options for bay leaves. But you use them as, as a... As a um, um, as, as a spice, basically as a flavoring. Um, sometimes French chefs will use them in a, you know, in a little, uh, bag that they throw in with a bunch of different herbs in it so they can pull them out and all that herbs, the, the flavors in there, but you don't have to deal with any of the, the leftover pieces. Uh, but bay leaves are super easy. You just pick off an entire leaf, you throw it in there. They're very easy to dry too. Um, and it's an evergreen. So I forgot to mention that about basil. Let's go back to basil. Basil's an annual. You have to plant that every year. So basil, you got to plant every year. The frost is going to kill it. Um, and that, that is normal. That happens. Um, and then you just plant it again each season. Um, but bay is evergreen. So this is actually a really pretty bush. Uh, it can grow into a small tree. You got lots of different options with this. So it's a really, really good, valuable herb to use around the, the, the kitchen and in your garden. So we got bay. So then the next one is catnip. You know, hey, for our, our uh, furry friends, our feline friends. We've got catnip. Let me see if I can get it out of here. So here's catnip. So catnip is lots of fun to watch your, you know, your cats roll around in it. You can use it inside. You can dry it and put it in toys. Um, but catnip is a great one. Uh, very easy one to grow. Very easy. Uh, perennial comes back every year. Um, but catnip is super, super easy. A lot of people use it for borders, for flowering borders. Really pretty plant. And actually, you can use the leaves. A lot of people will use them in uh, teas. Um, so you can actually use this as, as, as a tea for, um, for, um, the leaves for the tea. So, but if you've got a cat, you might love catnip. Uh, so catnip is a very easy one. A perennial comes back every year. And then what's next on my list? We've got chives. So chives, we've got two different flavors of chives. We've got your regular onion chives. So that's your regular onion chives right here. So it just says chives. And then you got your garlic chives. The way to tell, can you see the difference? Onion chives, purple flower, garlic chives usually have a white flower. Um, so the flowers are actually edible on these. The nice thing about chives is, I'll try and keep them out of my face, um, I love that smell, uh, is it gives you kind of a light onion, oniony taste or a light garlicky taste. So if you don't love onion, but you kind of want the flavor of onion a little bit, great on potatoes and eggs, uh, lots of different uses for these. Um, soups, salads, a lot of people use them with the soft cheeses. Um, so lots of versatility here. One of the easiest herbs to grow. So this is perennial. A lot of people have them make it all the way through the winter. Sometimes they get a little rough looking in the winter. That's okay. Um, but again, very easy to grow. Uh, a little bit more on the tricky side to, to dry. 
Uh, so you might try freezing them or putting them in butters because butter can last, last a long time. Uh, putting them in a cheese or something like that so you can use them at the end of the season. But chives are super easy, kind of a pretty plant when they start to bloom with those really pretty flowers. Let's see if I can get it. There you go. So there's the purple, sorry, backwards. This is the garlic chives, the white bloom, and then the purple bloom on your onion chives. So chives are awesome. Definitely use them. Um, let me go to my next list. So then we've got, of course, cilantro. So cilantro is very, very popular. Um, our favorite one is called Santo Cilantro. And I'll tell you why it's our favorite. Santo Cilantro is slower to bolt. If you've ever grown just regular cilantro, so I grabbed a pack of seeds here, some coriander cilantro. Um, you can grow a lot of herbs from seeds. I forgot to mention that. Again, I always tell people when they're Thinking about doing seeds, plan, do you need 75 cilantro plants <laughs> um, or do you need one? So think about that when you're doing it. Success rate, very high. You got it. You know it's growing. Seeds, you got to know how to grow seeds. And um, not that it's hard. It's very easy to do. Um, just think about that. Do I really need a lot of cilantro? And, and some people do. Some people use a ton of cilantro um, but or basil or chives or a lot of the different things that you can actually grow from seed. Uh, but Santo cilantro is one of the best because it's slower to bolt. And if you've ever grown cilantro before, you know that typically when we start to warm up, it starts to flower. And when it starts to flower, it stops producing leaves. And when herbs stop producing leaves, which is what you want to use, um, then it then it it's not gonna it's not it's just gonna go into seed producing mode. Now the nice thing about cilantro is you can dry the seeds. So what you want to do is right when you want to let it go to seed. And then right when it goes to seed, cut those flower spikes off, dry them, and you've got coriander, which coriander is great um, in a lot of Indian dishes and different types of different, uh, you know, savory dishes. Uh, but cilantro, of course, is quintessential in all your salsas, Mexican dishes, um, very, very easy to use. Santo is great because it kind of is slow. Again, use it or lose it. If you just kind of let this plant get big, it's not going to think it's going to get cut. It's going to start to go into flower mode. But it's a nice, steady grower. You keep using it, it'll keep producing leaves well into the summer, um, and then you'll start to get the flowers, and then again, you can use those as well uh, to dry for the seeds for coriander. So Santo cilantro, awesome, awesome herb. You gotta love that smell. Don't get confused between parsley. I'll pull that back out later, and I'll show you that leaf. Very, very confusing to kind of tell the difference between cilantro and parsley. So the nice thing about these tags, too, I'll tell you real quick, you stick this in the ground, and then it's your little marker for all your herbs so you know exactly what they are. So don't throw these away. It helps when you're identifying your herbs in your, in your herb garden. So Santo Cilantro, our favorite. Um, let's go to dill. So dill, there we go. I got a little dill here that just came in. So we've got the fern leaf dill. Fern leaf is, as you can see it, whenever you see that AAS, it's an all-American selection. So fern leaf dill is a very, very good dill. Um, obviously a very popular one amongst the swallowtails. Swallowtails love to lay their eggs on this and they'll hatch and they'll eat it up. So if you've ever been like, I can't grow dill, something keeps eating it up, it's the swallowtail. So it's not a bad thing. So you might plant a couple of them um, because you might need more, but they can get pretty big. I mean, they can get, you know, somewhere around the 18 to 24 inch height, uh, but fern leaf dill is awesome. Very easy. Sometimes you might want to stake it if it starts to get big because it can fall over. But uh, fern leaf dill, you use them a lot. So this is an annual. And sorry, I forgot to mention that about cilantro. Cilantro is an annual. You got to plant that every year. Uh, dill is an annual. Uh, great in potato on potatoes, eggs, fish, a lot of dips. A lot of people use these for vegetable and chip dips. Uh, dill, grilled meat. And of course, one of the main ingredients in pickling. If you're pickling your cucumbers, then you need some dill. Uh, and then if you're raising butterflies, you got to have dill. Dill is one of the one of the three plants that our swallowtails will lay their eggs on. Dill, I'll show you fennel and parsley. So you got those three choices for the swallowtails. But dill is a great herb, very easy to grow. It is an annual. You want to plant this one every year. Um, so dill, fern leaf dill, AAS winner, awesome plant. All right, and then we've got fennel. So as I mentioned, we'll move on to fennel, another swallowtail favorite. This is bronze fennel. I love bronze fennel. Um, it doesn't form the bulb at the bottom. So sweet fennel, a little bit harder to get. We don't have any right now. We'll get more in. You can grow that one from seed. But sweet fennel and bronze fennel are almost identical, except for what I find is the swallowtail maybe don't blow, lay their eggs on this one as much. So that's why I typically grow it. I'll grow my dill and I'll grow a sweet fennel for the, for the swallowtails. But bronze fennel I kind of use for myself. Downfall is you don't get that 
that bulb at the bottom and that bulb can be used in salads um, and um, different types of uh, dishes. You, some people cook it. Uh, so that bulb for sweet fennel, you won't get on bronze fennel, but bronze fennel has all the great qualities of sweet fennel. Um, it's very easy to use for salads and fishes and soups. Um, so, and a tea can actually be made um, out of fennel. A lot of people use fennel to make tea um, to help with indigestion if you've got an issue with an indigestion. Um, so very, very easy. And a lot of people can use the, the seeds too. So when they go to seed, the downfall of seed with this one, because fennel is an annual, so you're going to plant this one every year. If you let it go to seed naturally in your yard, it's going to pop up all over the place next year. And that's called volunteers. And typically it's not going to come back in the exact same spot that you planted it where you want it to grow. Um, it's going to come up all over the yard. So a lot of people will use the seed. Fennel seed is used in a lot of different types of applications. Um, so use your fennel, dry the seeds. It's a great spice. Um, and then, you know, you've got a lot of versatility here with, with fennel. But bronze fennel is a really good one. Sweet fennel we'll get in as, as we can. But bronze fennel we have plenty in right now. Uh, so a great one. Swallowtails, if you want to feed the swallowtails, great one. Uh, if you want to feel, feed the little baby swallowtails, the larva, the worms, um, great one. But also great in a lot of dishes. Bronze fennel. All right. And then we're on to lavender. So lavender is next. So many different types of lavender. Lavender has become so, so popular. Essential oils, soaps, you know, the fragrance, the de-stressing of it. There's so many different options. So lavender is a evergreen. Should be able to make it through here year round. If you ever have experienced an issue with lavender, let me tell you what lavender wants. Think Mediterranean, think Italy. What does Italy have? Similar temperatures to us, but they don't have as much humidity. So very well-drained soil. Usually you want to add some sand to your soil or more perlite. Perlite helps break up your soil. So if you plant them in the landscape and it's a fairly wet area, you definitely probably wouldn't want to do lavender. But if you want to make it drain better, perlite will help. And if you can grow them in um, a nice sandy soil or a perlite rich soil, something that drains really well, that's what they're going to love. Now the issues that most people have with lavender in this area is the humidity. So we have a lot of humidity in this area and they don't love humidity. They load a little bit more dry. So a lot of people grow them in pots, like this guy right here growing in this pot. Um, very easy to grow in pots. You can control the moisture level a lot easier. So it drains very well. Um, but you can also um, grow, so you can grow them in containers, you can grow them in the landscape. Uh, they're very easy to grow. It's just got to get the right conditions. But if you've ever experienced an issue, winter hardiness, they're very winter hardy. Again, sometimes we can have really wet winters and that can cause mold and mildew and start to hurt the lavender. But lavender is awesome, it blooms, you can use them in potpourris, you can use them in sachets in your drawers, uh, lots of different options there for you, but uh, lots of different types too. So let me tell you about a couple different types. This is Goodwin Creek, I believe, yep, Goodwin Creek, so you can see that one. One of my favorites, love the leaf, love that texture, really, really cool uh, flowers with that purple, blue, lavender spike. Um, and this one's nice because it's a little bit more compact. So it kind of forms a nice little compact shape by itself. Uh, they get about two to three feet high. Pretty much all of the varieties kind of do in that similar size range. So two by two, three by three, somewhere in that range. But this is a really, really good variety. Let me show you another one. We've got Provence lavender. So that's kind of more of your French lavender. So you can see there, that one gets about the same size, different leaf. So you get that different leaf. And then if you can see, there's a little bit bluer of a bloom on that one. So you got your Provence lavender. Again, lots of different uses for all these different types of lavenders. And there's so many different ones and we carry the bigger ones in this one gallon size. So if you want more for the ornamental purposes, uh, just for the fragrance, just to rub your hands through and smell, uh, lots of different types. These are just some of the smaller starter plants. This is Hidcoat. So Hidcoat's a little bit more of a dwarf too. So I believe this one gets, yep, 12 to 14 inches. So a little bit more compact and you can see it just by the, just by the look of that plant right there. It's got that nice compact look to it. But again, purple flowers, blooms. You can use lavender for the dried flowers for perfumes, essential oils. Uh, some people use it for flavoring jams or ice cream. Um, so great in the landscape, great in containers, great as a border. Lots and lots of choices of lavender. And we have lots of different selections to choose from. So lavender is another good one. Uh, let's see, let's move on to uh, lemon balm I forgot to grab. So I'll tell you about lemon balm real quick. Lemon balm is a perennial. Um, it's got kind of a lemony taste. It's used for soups and salads and sauces. Um, and then sometimes you can use it for game or fish, um, herbal teas, potpourri. Lemon balm is awesome. It kind of looks like uh, mint a little bit. Uh, so I'm sorry that I didn't grab it. We do carry lemon balm. So if you're out there interested in lemon balm, that's a perennial. That one will come back every year. 
Um, so lemon balls, a uh, lemon balm is a great herb. Gives you that kind of citrusy lemon taste to it. Um, so I apologize that I didn't show you that. I just missed that one. Uh, but lemon balm, we do carry a great herb. Uh, so the next one would be lemongrass. Lemongrass. There we go. So there's our lemongrass. And as you can tell, as I say, wok stars. So wok stars. So you're gonna use a lot of this in Vietnamese dishes. You're gonna use it in, um, sorry, in Thai. So I want to make sure I get it on my notes right. Thai, Vietnamese. Um, but what a lot of people use lemongrass for these days is just its ornamental purpose. It's a gorgeous grass by itself. It's just really pretty. It has these really arching branches. This can get three to four feet high in the landscape. So it's just a really pretty grass. Sometimes they'll make it through our winters. Sometimes they won't. It's right on that borderline. So I typically will call it an annual. Um, you're going to typically plant this every year. But what's really cool about lemongrass is it's great for repelling insects and mosquitoes. So it just has a natural oil in it that you can smell and it's in the air and it will keep mosquitoes away. So if you want to plant one of these in a big pot, then you can plant them in a big pot and then you can put it uh, downwind from you so that it blocks the mosquitoes from smelling you because they smell the lemongrass instead and they're not attracted to it. In fact, they're repelled from it. Uh, and as you can see those skewers right there, so as this plant gets bigger and you get these nice long hard shoots, that's where you're actually going to get the uh, the cooking part. That you kind of cut it up like a scallion almost. So a lot of people use it for that, and then you can use the leaves as well for different purposes. Um, but some people will skewer kebabs with this little uh, th that that little stalk right there. So as this plant gets big, it's going to get a nice strong base. You just go cut it off at the base, cut a nice little sharp point, and you can make kebabs on it. So shish kebabs right on lemongrass skewers. Um, so really really cool plant, ornamental, great for repelling insects. Awesome, awesome one. So lemongrass, another really cool one. Uh, let's see, what's next on my list? We got mint, of course. Mint, so many different types of, of mint, so many choices. Peppermint, of course, is probably one of the most common. Peppermint, spearmint, very easy. If you've ever grown mint, so mint is evergreen um, is, or slightly perennial. Um, sometimes it can get a little rough looking again in the winter, but mint is very, very easy to grow. If you've ever grown mint, you know it's hard to control. But it's a great ground cover. So if you're using it in your landscape, or if you're using it in an area that you haven't been, at, you know, had a great opportunity to grow a lot of different things, um, and you just want a great ground cover that's super, super easy and super low maintenance, mint is awesome. It will spread. It'll find a way. Um, I grew this in a pot in a clay pot. You grow it, put it on the ground. It falls over the edge like this, hits the ground, and starts rotting. And it takes off. Um, so a lot of people grow mint in containers just to control it, which is great. But mint is used in a lot of types of dishes. Uh, so that there's peppermint, there's spearmint. Um, we got, let's see, I got chocolate mint, which is really kind of cool. So chocolate mint, so you can see the teapot there. So great for teas. Um, so chocolate mint's another variety. And then the one that is probably the most popular these days is our mojito mint. So great for making drinks, teas. I love to drop this in lemonade. Kind of adds different texture, different flavor to lemonades. Um, so mint, so many different opportunities there. So let's see, let me make sure I hit all of them. We've got um, jellies. You can use them in jellies, teas, lemonades, drinks, adult drinks uh, like mojitos. Um, and this one actually is really cool. I was just reading the story about this, which I didn't know. So I learned something uh, the other day when I was reading about this. This came from Cuba, and this is the original mojito mint. So if you've ever used another type of mint I've had to have a mint julep or a, a mint mojito, um, it can be a little strong. It can be a little overpowering. And this one's a little bit more subtle. It's a little bit more easygoing. If you've ever wanted to use a mint, this is a great one. Look how big those leaves can get. I mean, just an awesome mint. Stands a little bit more upright, but it will spread. Um, but great leaves. Just love that fragrance. I mean, it's just that classic mint. You can use this in all the applications that you would use any mint. It's just a really, it's a little bit um, more subtle, a little bit more easygoing. Um, and once you try this one, I don't think you'll ever go back. Um, it's my favorite, mint mojito. So lots of different types of mint. Apple mint. Um, you know, there, there's even more that I probably am missing. Spearmint, peppermint, apple mint, chocolate mint, mint mojito. Lots of different choices of mint. Very easy to grow. If you think you have a, a black thumb, you'll have a green thumb if you want to grow mint. Can't kill this stuff. Very easy to grow. So definitely use mint. Um, what's next? Oregano. Uh, so oregano, let's see, did I grab one? Yep. Yeah. I got Italian oregano. Oregano comes in a lot of different types too. So Italian oregano, Greek oregano, um, it is a, it's, it's an evergreen or perennial. So again, can get a little rough looking in the winter, um, but you can use it in a lot of different dishes. Of course, you think of it for Italian 
Greek, Mexican dishes, pizza. You think pizza, of course, you gotta have oregano. Stews, even chili. So there's one called hot and spicy. So there's an a, a oregano called hot and spicy. It's a little bit more uh, flavorful. It's got a little bit more spice behind it, a little bit more heat behind it. So you might be using that in chilies or maybe you like a little spice on your pizza. Um, so, you know, great option there. There's uh, golden oregano. There's a lot of different types of oregano. So Italian, Greek, uh, golden, and then hot and spicy are some of our favorites, uh, but lots of different options there. Very easy to dry, very easy to grow. Really makes it very well through the, the seasons here. Uh, super, super easy, very easy uh, herb to, to, to grow in this area. It gets about you know 12 to 18 inches high and spreads about 18 to, to 24 inches. So it can get a nice big size plant on this. So give it some space in the garden or grow it in a container by itself. Gorgeous plant, use them or lose them. So there's oregano. Uh, parsley, of course, parsley. So we've got a couple different types here. This is curly parsley. I'm going to show you that one. And then a flat leaf parsley. So you got your Italian flat leaf parsley, as you can see there, the flat leaf. And then you got your curly parsley. So you can see all those curls. So parsley, again, another favorite of the swallowtails. If it gets eaten up in the summer, it's because the swallowtails found it, laid their eggs, and the swallowtail larvae are eating up the, the parsley. And that's okay. Parsley is very easy. It grows year round here. Um, so in the winter, obviously it won't grow as much. So don't use as much in the winter. So again, in the fall is a great time to dry some. Um, but flat leaf Italian parsley and then curly parsley, super easy. A lot of people use the curly for garnishing. Um, you know, if you're garnishing a, you know, a cheese or a butter or a dish or on top of your pasta dish, um, and you've got your flat leaf Italian parsley. Of course, parsley is used um, in uh, you know, any kind of tomato dish. So think about your tomato dishes, sauces, butter, fish. Uh, let's see, am I missing anything? Dressings, stuffing. So as we kind of get closer and closer to Thanksgiving, you know, I think you got to have your parsley still. Um, so parsley is evergreen. It'll make it through the winter. Sometimes it'll kind of hang really bad. Uh, the, I mean, you want to use it, but um, when you go into the winter months, don't cut it all the way back. It's harder for it to come back from, the, from there because they are evergreen. They're going to continue to produce food for itself. So it might get a little raggedy in the winter, but it'll come right back and your parsley can come back year after year. So Flat leaf parsley and curly leaf parsley. So while I've got my parsley out, I'll pull my cilantro back out and you can kind of see there how similar they are. They almost look identical. So you got your parsley is gonna be a little bit more on the waxy leaf. Let me see if I can get a good image of that. So parsley is gonna be a little bit more waxy and then cilantro is gonna be a little bit more dull. Very, very similar looking leaves. I mean, almost identical. So very difficult to tell. So that's why I say use your little tag as a marker. Great little option, but Parsley, really, really common herb. A lot of people use it, um, so definitely a great one. Uh, so what's next on my list? Uh, let's see, we've got rosemary. Of course, rosemary. Lots of different types of rosemary as well. So I'll start with you know the original, the Tuscan blue. So this is Tuscan blue rosemary. Um, you know, very easy plant to grow in the landscape. You can grow them in containers. Uh, again, think of Tuscany, think of Italy, think of the Mediterranean, dry, not a lot of humidity, so you definitely want to plant this in a well-drained soil. When it gets hot here, they like moisture, so water it in the morning, but let it dry out by you know midday. It needs to get its moisture, it needs to go away. So great in containers, great if you want to add some sand or some perlite to your, to your uh, soil, that really helps the drainage, uh, helps it get its water. It wants water, but then it wants it kind of gone fairly quickly. Um, so that's kind of how you grow it. It's an evergreen, it's gonna come back, You know, it's gonna be there year after year, great for drying, Great for lots and lots of different types of dishes, but I'll tell you about those in a minute. So this is Tuscan Blue. Tuscan Blue gets that blue flower, which is awesome. Um, and then I'll go with our Creeping Rosemary. So maybe you don't have a place for a big rosemary bush in your yard, because most rosemary can get three to four feet high. Uh, you know, big bushes kind of can really expand out too and cover four or five feet of space if they get old with age. Um, but Creeping Rosemary could be a kind of a cool option. So this one is great because it, it grows about two to three feet, but it's prostrate. So it's gonna grow on the ground or over the edge of a container. So kind of a different use for a rosemary, creeping rosemary. Has that same great aroma. It's just amazing. Very, very good ground cover. Awesome in pots. So another good option or application. If you wanted to grow rosemary, but you don't have the space, much smaller, much easier to grow. So a really, really good one. And then our favorite, so this is our new favorite. I love this one, I put it, I mean, I, I definitely recommend this one. So this is barbecue rosemary. So barbecue rosemary is awesome. Big leaves, long shoots, you can see. I mean, this one's just starting. You can get really nice long shoots on a full mature plant that you can actually use right on the bar, right on the, um, 
the barbecue. Uh, you can actually skewer meat with them. So it's really, really great. So of course, obviously, rosemary barbecue is awesome. Great plant, gets about 36 to 48 inches, so about three to four feet, um, high and wide. Um, but very, very easy plant to grow. Um, rosemary is awesome, so I love this one. You can cut up so many different uses. So of course, with meats, poultry, uh, let's see, we've got you know an, an, a lot of soups and stews to flavor your oils and vinegars. Um, but what I love to do it, because I love to grill, um, is I'll take a couple branches and cut them off and use it to actually wipe my marinade on my meat as I'm grilling it. So it kind of adds that fragrance to it. You can use it with barbecue sauce. So you can just make kind of a bundle, you just wrap it up with some twine, and then use that as, a, as your brush to wipe on your sauces while you're grilling. Um, also, you can take a little bunch of it and throw it on the coals at the very last few minutes of cooking, um, and that kind of helps burst some flavor into it. So all that smoke that's gonna come off that green, fresh rosemary is gonna be great. Also, you know, going into the winter time frame, you can cut off some twigs, and you can throw it in a fire in your house. So if you're burning a fire in your uh, fireplace, Throw this on there, or maybe you're doing a fire pit out back. Throw a couple twigs on there. Gives you that great aroma, that great fragrance. Uh, so, so many different uses for, for rosemary. Very, very easy to use. Uh, let's see if I missed anything. Marinades on the grill. Um, soups, stews, poultry, meat. Lots, lots of different options. Rosemary is one of my favorites. Awesome, awesome plant. Very easy to grow. Lots of choices there, too. And we carry bigger ones. So, if you ever wanted like a bigger one, you want a little bit more instant gratification, Go for it. We've got some big one gallon and three gallon size as well. Um, so what's next on my list? Let's see if I've missed anything here. Uh, we've got sage. So after uh, rosemary, we've got sage. So forgotten sage, my favorite, because it's got those huge leaves. You gotta love that. So sage is perennial. Sage is basically evergreen. It'll make it through the winters as well. So great for your Thanksgiving stuffings. Uh, for turkey, definitely gotta have sage. Um, but sage is very easy to grow again. It's got that fuzzy leaf, really easy to kind of dry. Um, so sage is an awesome one. A couple different varieties out there. There's tricolor. Um, there's the burgotten, which I love. Really kind of that silvery, kind of soft leaf, fun to touch. Great for uh, lots of different things. For pork, you know, a lot of people use sage in, in sausages. Um, so you got pork, uh, butter, the sage butter that I mentioned earlier, soups. Breads. A lot of people make you know bread with some sage flavoring in it. Um, drinks. You can actually use this in drinks to kind of give it that kind of herbal fragrance. Um, so lots, lots, lots of different uses for sage, and it comes back year after year. It's there all year round. Uh, again, can sometimes get a little rough looking in the winter, um, but very, very easy to grow. Kind of again in that same kind of Mediterranean type of thing. So make sure it's well drained, great in containers, um, in the landscape. Just maybe add a little bit more perlite so that it has really well drained soil. But sage is a very easy one. And then, of course, if you're thinking sage, you might also be thinking pineapple sage, which pineapple sage is awesome. So you can use these in teas. So you can actually use the leaves of pineapple sage in teas. Most people grow sage for that red flower right there that the hummingbirds and butterflies love. You can actually see, look at that one. It's about to bloom right there. You got a little bloom on it. So sage, lots of different types of sage, pineapple sage, tricolor sage. The burgotten is my favorite for culinary purposes, um, but you might grow one for the butterflies and also use some leaves for your teas and stuff. Um, so lots of different choices there for sage. Um, and then stevia, I didn't grab stevia either. I think we just got it in, but stevia kind of has a similar leaf to this. Um, so I'll come back to this one in a minute because I missed this one. But stevia is a great natural uh, sugar uh, sweetener. Um, so it's not gonna do the same things that sugars do. So sugars, you know, can rot your teeth, um, they can raise your blood sugar, um, but stevia is all natural. It's a sweetener. Throw three or four leaves in your coffee and you got a sweetener in your tea. Lots of different options for stevia. Um, so if you haven't grown stevia, very easy. Throw in some lemonade. Um, it won't rot your teeth and won't, won't raise your blood sugar. And so very, very, very great natural sweetener. Um, so stevia is a great one. Um, let's see. I'll go back because I missed this one, lemon verbena. So lemon verbena is a perennial. Uh, it's got that lemony taste, great for soups, salads, sauces, game fish, uh, or game and fish, uh, herbal teas, potpourri. So a lot of people love lemon verbena. So there you go. That one's a really good one. So different kind of one. Uh, so lemon verbena is another good option for herb. Let's see. What am I on to next? So tarragon. Uh, let's see, did I bring tarragon? I did, I got tarragon. Tarragon's kind of hard. A lot of people don't probably grow tarragon as much, uh, but in French dishes, you gotta have tarragon. That's what it looks like right there. So there's French tarragon. 
I mean, it's probably, I think in French cuisine, um, it's probably one of the top three herbs that they use. Uh, so French tarragon is awesome, uh, used for chicken, fish, vegetables, and eggs. Uh, also used in salads, tomato dishes, dressings, sauces, lots and lots of different versatilities for French tarragon. They get about 30 to 36 inches high, so a pretty good sized plant, uh, and about 12 to 15 inch spacing um, on these, but full sun, awesome, awesome. Uh, tarragon is a perennial, so it could come back every year, which is great, you know, as that value that it'll come back every year. But French tarragon, very, very good herb. Uh, one of those, you know, if you're a French chef or you do French cuisine, you gotta, you gotta have tarragon. You probably love it and you use it all the time. So tarragon's another good one. Um, and we got plenty of tarragon in right now. And then of course, to finish off our teas is thyme. Lots and lots of different types of thyme. Uh, English thyme, French thyme, um, and then this really pretty lemon thyme here. Look at that, that variegated foliage. Awesome, awesome plant. So you got lemon thyme, English thyme. I didn't grab a French thyme, but there's a couple different types of thyme. Um, really, really easy, evergreen, grows you know, very, very well in this area. Great trailers, so great in containers. Um, and you can use this on lots and lots of different things. Um, obviously the seasoned meats, chicken, fish, vegetables, soups, stuffing, sauces, dressings, uh, lots and lots of different options for thyme. You know, it's just so easy to use. Use the twig and all. A lot of people try and strip all those little leaves off. I just use the whole twig, just chop it all up, throw it in your dish. Super, super easy, uh, very easy to grow. Great trailer, it's a gorgeous plant. I mean, you can actually get a lot of woolly thymes and some of the other ornamental thymes, Corsican thyme, um, that grows very, very low to the ground, uh, very dense, great ground cover. So in between stepping stones and pavers, and you get that little thyme fragrance as you walk around in it. So we carry those as well. But these are your herbal thymes, so the ones that you're gonna actually use for your cuisines and stuff. Uh, so lemon thyme and uh, English thyme, French thyme, lots of different options there as well. So let's see if I missed anything on my list. I think I went through everything. Lots and lots of choices. I mean, just all these plants that I'm now surrounded by, it's just great. Uh, lots and lots of choices. And they're so easy, so versatile. Uh, lots of uh, different uh, flavorings. Um, there's so many different ways to use them in recipes. I can't, I mean, that's a whole other class on how to actually cook with them. But I hope I've given you enough information to grow herbs. And that was kind of the basics of herbs is growing them. So we talked about all the different versatility of them, uh, using them in pots, windowsills, growing them indoors. You can use them in a sunny window or under grow light. You can grow them in raised beds. You can grow them in your landscape. Lots and lots of different options for them. Invest in your soil. Make sure it's very important to, to invest in your soil. So if you're growing in pots, use a good high-grade potting soil. Of course, McDonald all-purpose potting soil or natural organic potting soils are a great deal. Always $9.99 for a one cubic foot bag. Buy two, get one free all the time. So if you needed a couple bags of potting soil, get the free one. Get the free one. Um, so we've got our all-purpose uh, potting soil and natural organic compost, perlite to amend your soil if you're using them in the landscape or if you're using them um, in, in your vegetable garden or in, in, a, in an actual bed um, in, in the ground. Um, and then, um, of course, sunlight. Give them as much sunlight as you possibly can. But the nice thing about herbs is they can grow in a little bit of shade. So just remember, they're going to stretch a little bit. You might get, I don't think I have one that's really stretching, but, you know, as you kind of, you get that kind of longer shoot kind of growing out, stretching for light, that's okay. It's just trying to find it. Um, it's not gonna hurt the plant. You might not get as many leaves, um, but uh, you can grow these in a little bit of shade, that's okay. Um, a lot of people grow them in containers because it's easy to kind of give them a little summer reprieve. When it's really, really hot outside and you're watering them once or twice a day in a pot, the nice thing about growing them in a pot is you can bring them up on the deck. You can bring them into a little bit of a shadier area so you're not watering as much and they'll do perfectly fine when it's hot. You know, give them four hours of sunlight rather than eight, that's okay. So herbs are very versatile. The pH is very versatile. You don't have to worry about pH as much. You don't have to fertilize as much. You know, every six to eight weeks versus vegetables, which are every four to six weeks. Um, and that's in the ground. In a pot, you're about every four to six weeks, whereas vegetables are every three to four weeks. So um, vegetables are trying to produce food and produce something. Um, herbs are just producing leaves, so they're much easier. So I definitely recommend trying them. Lots and lots of different applications. Drying them, using them fresh. Of course, use them fresh right now. Best time to use them fresh. Cut them, use them or lose them. My best advice for herbs, use them or lose them. Um, so definitely prune them, snip away, use them around your house, use the flowers to, to make flower arrangements. They're great for inside. Lots and lots of different things. There's so much information about herbs. Um, I hope you enjoy this. I'm gonna answer the questions now. So thank you again for joining and I'll get to your questions here. All right. So let me scroll on down. Everybody's saying hi. 
Let's see if I can come down here. Okay. So we got got my cilantro, basil, mints, thyme, tomatoes, and a bunch of stuff stocked up. Thank you, Brandon. Thanks for shopping with us. I did a winter planter so we can reach out the window and pick what we want. I, I love that. In my old house, I had that exact same setup. It was awesome. Uh, what soil care do you recommend for a mature outdoor herb plot? Thanks. So again, if you're growing it right, it sounds like you're growing it right in the ground. Um, definitely. So this is Melody. Hello, Melody. Um, you definitely want to amend your soil. Sandy soil, peat moss, and compost. Peat moss is going to help hold in moisture, and the compost is going to add nutrients and break it apart. And then in, in clay soil, then you definitely, because we're one or the other typically, I mean, unless you're lucky and you just got perfect fertile soil, um, but typically most people have clay or sand. So in clay soil, you want compost and perlite. That'll help amend your soil. Now, if it's an old um, uh, raised bed that you haven't used in a while, then you probably just need to amend it with maybe even a potting soil um, or a raised bed mix or just some compost and perlite just to kind of refresh it or maybe a little bit of peat since it's raised. Um, but let us know a little bit more about your condition there. Um, if you come in, we can definitely help you. And if you know your square footage of your raised beds or your area, that'll also help us recommend how much you need because we can get kind of a little bit more pinpoint accuracy on what you need there. Um, how do you harvest the plants safely what you need without killing the whole thing? Ryan, great question. Uh, so typically the rule of thumb is don't prune a plant more than one third. So if you need a lot of mint and you want to take the whole thing off, well, it's mint, so you're not going to kill it most likely. <laughs> but once it's established, you won't. Um, but typically the rule of thumb is don't take off more than one third. So let's grab, I won't grab the mint, for example, because I just said you really can't kill mint. Um, but let's say this cilantro right here. So if I was going to take some of this and use it, I'm typically going to try, and if you can see in there real close, I'm typically going to try and cut off some of these lower branches here um, and use those and keep that center stem. But typically I would not take more than that, you know, a third. You don't want to take two thirds because that's too much. Now mint and some of the other ones that are a little bit more aggressive, oregano, you can probably take a little bit more. Some actually recommend that you take a little bit more. Um, to kind of help kind of prevent it from getting wild um, and kind of overgrown. But um, but yes, don't, don't be afraid about where to prune it. I mean, typically if you're, so like basil is a good one. Let me see if I can find my basil. Where did I put my basil? Uh, let's see. I got them all over the place. They're over here. So basil is an easy one to kind of show you. If you're going to prune, prune it above a leaf. So here, let's look at this long shoot. You see that long shoot right there? And you see that little tiny leaf sticking out over here. So I'm gonna prune it right above that, uh, probably about a quarter of an inch. And then that way it gives it an area for it to regrow from. Um, if you just take it way up here, so if I take it from way up here, then it's gonna die back all the way back before it produces a new leaf. So you kind of see that node. So again, once this plant continues to grow, you see new leaves coming from there. So as that continues to grow up, then you'll have more leaves to kind of pick down to. Um, so you don't wanna go all the way down to the ground. You, don't, you wanna kind of go to where there's another leaf coming out so that it can sprout from in between there and continue to grow. Again, practice makes perfect. Just try it, start cutting, try different techniques. Uh, very, very simple. You really can't mess it up unless you cut too much of it off. If you cut too much, that can kill it. Another good thing is clean your pruners. So very important to disinfect your pruners because if one of your herbs has some sort of disease, they're pretty disease resistant plants, but one of them has some sort of fungus or something in it and you prune it and then you take it to another plant, it can transfer that disease. So it's great practice just to, after you prune one herb, Go and wash off your pruners. Use a little rubbing alcohol, a little mouthwash works pretty well. So I always have a little spray bottle you know, on my belt loop. So when I'm out there pruning, I can just take it and spray it a couple times, disinfect it, ready to go prune. Um, so that's a great little piece of advice. So great question, Ryan. Uh, all right, Lee, my cilantro keeps dying. I've tried it in different locations with different light. So again, if it's, if it's dying, then there might be an issue with your soil. Maybe your pH is way out of whack. If you're doing it in a pot. Um, so Lee, I, I, it's hard to say what that could be. Um, if it is flowering, typically they're going to flower and then kind of die off a little bit somewhat. They certainly aren't going to regenerate. Then that's because maybe it's a variety that, that flowers very quickly. Uh, cilantro, when it warms up, that's typically when it struggles. It loves a range of temperatures of about 50 degrees to about 80 degrees. It gets hotter than that, it's harder to grow. It gets cooler than that, it's harder to grow. So it's a very kind of temperamental plant about temperature range. Uh, so Lee, great question. A, a lot of people might have bought cilantro two or three weeks ago we've had a couple nights that have been pretty chilly and you might have lost your cilantro that tender new growth not going to love those cool nights down to 40 or below 40 uh, so that might have been the issue too so hopefully that helps 
um, maybe fertilizer, maybe pH, maybe the type of soil you're growing it in. So it could be a lot of different things there. Um, I planted a raised bed with hot peppers, bell peppers, and eggplants. Can herbs work as filler around these plants? Definitely. Definitely recommend it. Uh, you know, great companion plants. Um, so they all can kind of work together. Um, great kind of filler. Uh, instead of mulch, you might use thyme because thyme's a great ground cover. Mint. Now, mint might choke it out a little bit, so maybe I might take that back a little bit. Um, but oregano, uh, thyme, even parsley, if you've got a little space for a little bunch, you don't want to create too much, um, uh, uh, you don't want to block the airflow. So that would be my advice there. Uh, Curtis is definitely, yes, use the herbs amongst that, those areas and those open spaces, but limb up some of your vegetable plants so they've got space to grow underneath. Um, they'll share nutrients, that's not a problem, but you don't want to block airflow and create a, an issue with your vegetable plants getting fungus. Um, so definitely a great question. You can definitely do it. Love the soil webinar. Great. Thanks, Denise. Um, can you buy home pH tests? Yes, you can. We do. We sell home pH tests. Uh, we actually have a little 10 pat or a, it's, a, it's got nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and pH. And you can test all four of those things. Um, it's got 10 per test. Um, and then we've also just got a pH tester. They're very simple, $9.99, $19.99, depending on the level. But we also do it for free. So if you want to bring in Soil sample will do up to five per visit. Um, so uh, if you want to do different locations, but typically I just say, you know, if you're doing a vegetable garden, maybe take two or three little samples with a spoon, put it in a bag, mix it up, you'll get a general range. Um, and then that way we can get you in the right range for your different types of herbs. Um, all right. And then, uh oh, somebody lost audio. I hope that wasn't our mistake. I have a lot of trouble with cilantro too. I know cilantro is tough, and it's really because it's that range. And we can go from spring to summer. And like the blink of an eye. So um, I typically recommend, uh, you know, growing cilantro in a pot. So maybe you can help out with some of that temperature fluctuation. Don't plant it too early. Don't plant it too late. Um, right now is a great time. Uh, so it loves that kind of temperature range. When it gets hot, it tends to flower. Santo cilantro, if you haven't tried that one, try that one. Um, Santo cilantro is a very, very good one. Slower to bolt. Um, and, and typically does very well in this area. So rich, fertile soil. Of course, you know, every tag is going to say that. I want rich, fertile soil. Everybody would want that. Um, but we can help you get there. Um, so maybe doing a pH test, seeing what your pH is. Again, fertilizer. Are we fertilizing too much? Are we fertilizing with the wrong thing? Cut them, use them or lose them. Santo cilantro, I mean, it tells you right on the tag to keep using it because it'll help kind of keep producing leaves rather than just letting it sit and then starting to go into flower mode. Uh, but again, it's usually that temperature range and our, again, kind of cilantro, you know, think again, that kind of dry, arid weather and we tend to be more humid. Uh, so sometimes that can be an issue. But I love growing in a pot because it's a little bit easier to control what it's going through. Um, and then Wendy asked, so once it flowers, you can't use it anymore. Um, no, not necessarily. Um, typically cilantro, it can come back after it flowers, but typically it spends its all its energy on flowering and producing that seed, and then that's where you can kind of use it for coriander, and typically it's not gonna come back. I've seen a couple times where it does. Um, again, it depends on the temperature, it depends on if it's depleted of nutrients, um, but typically it's kind of done after it's, it's gone to flower. Um, that's what it's gonna be doing the whole time. Um, again, if you can control the temperature a little bit, if you can bring it to a cooler place, that might help it from stop flowering um, and then continue to give you leaves. Um, so a lot of people do grow coriander from, or cilantro from seed because you might want to have a couple different batches of it. Um, so Melissa said, I missed the tomato talk. Was it recorded so I can go back and watch it and listen to it? Yes, you definitely can. Um, it's on our Facebook page. It's on our webpage. Uh, we also should have notes up there fairly soon. Um, can you mix a mushroom compost with pine soil? Definitely. Uh, pine soil is a great soil to add more nutrients to, and you can use lots of different types of compost. Um, there's probably some different types of compost in there, usually compost with bark, um, but this, uh, you could add definitely mushroom compost to a lot of different things. You just don't want to add too much. Too much compost and not enough things to break it up can create a very hot situation because that compost is biodegrading constantly, and so you don't want to create too much uh, heat. Um, and then, so do you, you or will you have African basil? I don't know. Um, I do know the pollinators go nuts for it. I definitely know that, uh, but I haven't seen it out there yet doesn't mean we won't get it, um, but I haven't seen it yet. So, you know, definitely check in with us. Maybe give us a couple weeks and see if maybe we got it in. Um, how much are the plants? Great question. I didn't even mention that. So all of our herbs in this little size are $5.99. So great little deal there. You get this great herb 
Uh, lots of different choices, and they're all $5.99 in this four-inch pot. Of course, if you get a bigger lavender, they might be $19.99 to $24.99. Same with rosemary. Um, our lemongrass is $9.99. So lemongrass is $9.99. Let's see, what else? Uh, bay. So our bays are going to be $16.99, I think, is what the price is. If I remember correctly, I think that's right. So a couple different price ranges, but typically all of our little starter herb, herb pots are going to be $5.99. Vegetables, $4.49. Herbs, $5.99. Um, I keep a parsley plant inside for myself and plant one outside for the caterpillars. Great idea. It's an awesome idea. Um, let's see. All of a sudden, I can't scroll down. See if I can get to everybody else. Um, so a per, a Becky asked um, if you can use the seeds to start growing again. You definitely can. Um, so as I mentioned with fennel, uh, a lot of times you don't want to let them go to seed because they'll go all over the yard um, and pop up all over the place. But you can definitely save the seed and use it to start again. That's the nice thing about most of your herbs is if it goes to seed and you collect the seed, you can plant it again. Whereas some of your vegetables that have been hybridized, you might not be able to do that with because you're not going to get that exact same parent plant. Uh, but most of your herbs are grown from seed. And so that way you can get that plant over and over and over again. But great question. So you definitely can. Which lavender varieties are culinary? Well, it really could be any of them. Um, I don't personally use lavender a lot to cook with, um, but some people use them in desserts um, and different things. But I think they all have a very similar fragrance. A lot of people use flowers and salads, um, so you can actually eat the flowers. They're edible. But most people use them for the fragrance, for the aroma, for soaps and perfumes and different applications there. Um, I had cat mint growing in pots with flowers that came back year, each year, then it died. Well, that can happen. Sometimes you don't know why. Um, sometimes maybe it froze because it was in a pot and it got too, too cold. Um, some of our uh, herbs are a little bit borderline, so you kind of kind of have to watch that. Um, the best thing to do is if you're worried about the hardiness is go and look up our hardiness zones. So you can just type that into a Google search and look up hardiness zone. Um, you know, we're typically in that eight uh, zone. So um, if it's a nine, it might make it, but sometimes it won't. So you kind of have to watch that. My sage came back in my raised bed garden, but it's flowering. Is that okay? Should I cut it back and cut off the flowers or do I let it bloom for the bees? So sage is different. So a lot of plants will flower like lavender, rosemary, sage, thyme, uh, chives. All of those will flower, um, but typically won't stop producing leaves. Um, and then if the bees are loving it, let the bees enjoy it. You can still pick the leaves and then it'll continue to grow because those grow year round here. So it's the ones that you don't want to, the, the annual ones that are going to bloom, those are the ones you typically don't want to bloom. Basil might be an option, although basil will continue to uh, produce leaves after it's done blooming. Um, but some plants you know, expend all their energy into blooming. It's the life cycle. It's why they bloom is to reproduce and form a seed. And once they've accomplished that, sometimes the, the host plant or the parent plant dies. Um, and that does, that does happen. Um, let's see. Which herbs repel insects? Great question. Um, so Deb, um, lots of different ones. The lemon verbena. The lemongrass, lemon balm, think that lemon citrusy taste, typically mosquitoes aren't going to like. Uh, I didn't show this one earlier, but I did grab it uh, because it's not really a culinary herb, but this is citronella geranium. Awesome. Mosquito plant helps repel lots of bugs and insects. Marigolds are also great. Um, so you can make a container with lemongrass, a marigold, and a citronella plant, um, and that'll help repel a lot of insects. So great question. Uh, let's see. What else we got? I love growing herbs, usually in pots, but thinking about growing in my landscape and backyard. So which are the safest for my dachshund to be around if I grow in the yard? Well, I don't think any herbs are going to hurt um, your, your dogs or animals um, because, I mean, we use them and we can eat them. So I don't think there's going to be any issue there. Um, so I, I doubt you'll have a problem with any of them, really. Um, I guess lemongrass could get a little sharp. Um, but other than that, I mean, pretty much all of them should be pretty safe. I mean, they'll probably love to roll around in a pile of mint if you got a, you know, a nice uh, bed of mint for the dog to lay in. Um, but I don't think you're going to have any issues with any of them. Um, I, I might have to check if you, if you're ever worried about a pet, a dog, and you're worried about poisonous plants, um, you can always check, um, the SPCA's website. Uh, they have a great list. You just type in the plant name and it'll tell you. Now, any plant will be poisonous. I mean, if I ate, you know, four pounds of mint, it would not be great for me either. Um, but it's just the degree. So you always kind of have to watch that. Um, so every plant is toxic to a degree, I would guess. 
Um, it, it just depends on how much you consume. Um, so sometimes it just causes an upset stomach. So it might say toxic to animals, but then it causes an upset, upset stomach. And usually if your dog eats it, it's probably, it's going to get an upset stomach and then it's never going to eat it again. Um, so stevia, do you use the leaves or do you crush it? So depends on the level of sweetness that you want. So in my coffee, I'll just drop three or four leaves in there. Um, in a tea, I usually crush it up a little bit to sweeten it up a little bit faster. But that coffee is going to kind of heat it up and release those, that, that sweetness a little bit quicker. So it just depends on what you're using it for, but you can definitely uh, crush it up or you can just drop the leaves in there. It depends on the degree of, uh, of sweetness. So if you want a sweeter tea, crush them up. If you want a less sweet tea, just drop them in. Um, I use my sage for sausage, ravioli, and brown butter sage sauce. Yep. I've never, I've got to be honest, I've never had brown butter sage sauce, but i got to try it because it was all over when I was talking to people about sage. Everybody was talking about it. Um, and when I was looking up stuff on the internet the other day, uh, you know, definitely brown butter sage was all over the place. So obviously a great thing for sage. Um, what is a good combination of herbs you can combine in a planter? Lots of them. I mean, I don't know if you saw this planter. That, I mean, pretty much any of them you can do. I mean, that's the great thing about herbs. They're so versatile. So this one's got... A little rosemary, it's got a thyme, sage, mint. Again, the possibilities are endless of the different types of mixtures. You might want to look at the different uh, sizes of plants. So I might not plant, you know, a rosemary in a pot that I plan on keeping there for a very long time because rosemary is going to be a bit. Um, I love doing rosemary in an individual pot by itself, a lavender in an individual pot by itself. Um, but if you're mixing some herbs, you might think of some of the ones that don't need a lot of space, uh, thyme, oregano parsley, uh, some of those that stay a little bit smaller and the ones that, and then also think about what are the ones that you're going to use, uh, plant those in a grouping together because at least you know, you're going to use them. Um, let's see. Best herbs to grow together in a container. So I was just talking about any herbs that don't like each other. Not that I know of. I mean, there definitely are some plants that form symbiotic relationships together. Um, but uh, I don't think any herbs are going to hurt each other if they're planted together. Um, so I don't think you'll have any issues there. I mean, mint obviously is an aggressive grower. Uh, I talked about that uh, a few times, um, but mint can definitely take over a container and can choke some plants out and use up all the nutrients because it's just growing everywhere. Um, but other than that, I don't believe that, that one plant could hurt the other. Um, so let's see. Our cilantro doesn't always last more than a few weeks in the summer, but believe it or not, we had a late planting of cilantro from early fall that came back. Any suggestions for helping the cilantro last through the summer? So unfortunately, not a lot of suggestions. When we get hot here, cilantro wants to bolt and it wants to flower. Um, again, growing it in a pot that you can bring into a little bit of a shadier location, um, or you know it's gonna be 100 degrees for a week, so you might bring it into a little bit of shade, try and keep it as cool as you can. You might even mulch the pot, might help keep the root system cool. I love to use mulch in my vegetable and herb gardens. I think it just looks prettier, um, but it keeps the temperature control a little bit more. When you can keep fluctuations of temperatures to a minimum, then you're much better off. Great question. Um, unfortunately, we live in Hampton Roads and our summers get hot and they get humid and plants are gonna bolt because they think it's the end of its life cycle. Um, so that's an unfortunate thing. But again, you can grow from seed, come back and get another one in the fall. Uh, you can definitely get another group in the fall. Again, remember cilantro loves that temperature range of about 50 degrees to 80 degrees. When we start to get way out of whack and be consistently above 80, it wants to start getting the bolt. Um, so, so think about that. Uh, Denise, thank you for joining. Victoria, thanks. Everybody saying thanks. Um, which herbs are good in shade? So again, a lot of them, uh, but uh, definitely parsley. Oregano does all right. Thyme definitely does okay. Cilantro will do okay. Basil usually does all right. Again, sometimes they're going to stretch a little bit. So I'm not going to say that they love shade, Stephanie, but I definitely think that you can do them. Um, and I would grow them in a pot because if you need to take them to a sunnier location, you can. Uh, but stretching just means that the plant's going to get a little leggy. It's going to be looking for that light. Look, there's my hand in the sun, so I found it, and then I can stay there. I can grow there. But um, if I'm in a shady spot, I'm looking for the light, so I'm trying to stretch for the light, and that's okay. It's not going to necessarily hurt the plant. Um, so you should be fine with, with a lot of different ones. Like I said, maybe don't do the ones with, like, fuzzy leaves. So, for example, where did my sage go? I don't know where my sage go. Oh, there it is. So sage, see how it's got that fuzzy leaf to it? So that can typically in a shady condition, uh, will we'll get a fungus attached to it, usually called powdery mildew, and that can start to form. Now it can be treated, so you can definitely treat it if you get it. Um, but try and think of different ones that, that definitely can take a little bit of shade. Parsley, uh, uh, um, some of the mints, the thymes, oregano's, those do very well. Uh, 
French lavender is really good to use in dessert, like cream, creme brulee, definitely. Um, thank you. All right, thanks, everybody. I think I got through every question. Uh, so uh, hopefully I didn't miss any questions. Again, thanks for joining. I hope you learned a lot. You know, Herbs 101, very, very simple. Uh, use them or lose them. It's my best advice. Fertilize, invest in your soil, prune them, use them, cook with them, try different experiments, talk to your friends and neighbors and, and, and family members, what they've always used herbs for. Uh, because there's so many different applications. I mean, I could spend all day probably just on lavender or just on basil, um, but use them or lose them, cut them, enjoy them. Lots of different options. Try different ones every year. Uh, try different ones right now. Have fun with it. Uh, lots of different applications. So versatile. Thanks again for joining um, our, uh, our seminar. We'll be back next week. Um, I think I've got moles and bowls next week and maybe peppers. Um, I can't really remember my schedule right now. I've got a lot of these going on. Um, but we'll be back next week and the week after that. We'll keep doing this Wednesdays and Fridays um, at 11 a.m. to kind of help continue to educate our favorite people, our customers. We love you. Uh, we hope you're staying safe. Uh, be good, and I will see you next time. Have a great day.